Dr. Okay, Rachel. Hi, Dr. Rubin. Hello. How are you? So just to do a quick summary, Dr. Rubin and I met, I'll call you Rachel. Rachel and I met uh, over Twitter because I had written an article in the Atlantic about estrogen. And we've had just a lot of back and forth at this point about vaginal estrogen, systemic estrogen. I've taken what I've learned from Dr. Rubin and I've given it to my gynecologist and it has changed my life. So first of all, I wanna ask you a very specific question, which is tell us what is the difference between systemic estrogen and vaginal estrogen and why does it matter? Absolutely. Um, and thank you for that question. It's really important that we all understand that hormones are not all the same thing. They are not all good or all bad, just like birth control, right? You can have a condom or you can have an IUD or you can have a birth control pill. Those are very different things, right? But they're all birth control. <clears throat> and so we have to understand hormones and menopause are all different. And there are hormones for your whole body, hormones that, um, <clears throat> sorry, you guys, no. hormones for your whole body that will help with hot flashes and night sweats, hormones for your whole body that might help prevent osteoporosis, hormones for your whole body that may help you sleep better uh, and may help with some you know, cognitive issues that can come up and may help with some anxiety and depression that can come up around perimenopause and menopause. That is for your whole body. Then there are local hormones that help your vulva, your vagina, your bladder, and the urethra. And the local hormones are safe for everyone, whether you're 40, 45, 55, or 95, the local hormones for your vagina, your urethra, your bladder, uh, and, and um, uh, your vulva uh, help absolutely everyone. And the most important thing about the local hormones is that they prevent urinary tract infections, which can kill you. And so it's really important that it's a preventative medication. And uh, as you discussed, it's not just UTIs, but they actually help you lubricate. They help the vagina not hurt to wipe it. Uh, they help with uh, pain with sitting. They help with urinary frequency and urgency. So there are so many benefits of local vaginal hormones and actually no downside. Um, occasionally someone may get a yeast infection, which you treat it and then they go away forever because you are changing your microbiome of your vagina to make it healthier and make it able to fight infection. So you don't get UTIs, you don't get BV, you don't get yeast infections. And so local hormones are very, very important and are different from whole body hormones. Now there are reasons for whole body hormones and there's reasons for local hormones. And in your case, there's reasons for both, which is <laughs> the magic of your, your story. So I came to you and I, we were talking more about UTIs. I was having recurring UTIs. I'm 56 years old. What's going on? And you said, and I said to you, I'm on Divigel, which is a local, uh, a, a, sorry, a systemic hormone. Shouldn't that be enough? And you said, not always and often not. And I, I actually see the mistake often in that someone will come and say, well, I'm on whole body hormones. I'm on an estrogen pill or an estrogen patch or a whole body you know, gel like you are on. Isn't that enough? And often doctors don't then screen for, well, she's also having frequency and urgency or a urinary tract infection. So we don't know what the exact numbers and you did find for quite a while. If I remember the UTIs were gone for quite yeah. a while. And so I kept telling you like, okay, I know you don't need it now, but, but just know that you may uh, at some point need something vaginally to give like a local treatment. And there is no downside to doing both. And so if you're on whole body hormones, your estrogen levels, depending on what dose you're on are going to be X. And if you add local hormones, it stays at X, right? It doesn't change up or down. If you add a local hormone on top of a whole body hormone. So tell us exactly what does the tissue of the vagina look like when there is no vaginal estrogen and what does it look like when you have it? It's really important to get your mirrors out and take a look. And if you look at any of my uh, pin tweets or any of my lectures that I give, I always show lots of pictures. And I think it's the best way I can describe it that people fully understand and really every, everyone understands this is think of a baby vulva, right? A lot of us have changed the diapers of baby girls. There are no labia minora. The opening is raw and red and irritated. It's so small that a tampon surely would not go into a baby vulva. So how is, it's not a sexual place of 
of course, that is no hormones, right? The, that, that body with no hormones, then puberty hits, you get a surge of estrogen and testosterone and you grow labia minora. The tissue becomes pink and healthy and thick. It lubricates. You can put tampons and you can have sex. Babies can come out of there. It's very stretchy. And so when you go into menopause and sometimes it can happen before menopause is official, right? Even if you're still getting periods, if you start having dryness or irritation or ooh, wiping just doesn't feel too comfortable or man, I need a whole boatload of lube more than I used to need, right? Or sex is now painful if penetration is something that was in your toolkit. And so, um, so that's what it looks red. It looks raw. It looks irritated. Sometimes it kind of looks pale and it, it it's dry. It actually loses wrinkles. We joke uh, in menopause, the wrinkles leave your vagina and go to your face. Like that's <laughs> the unfortunate uh, reality, but you actually want wrinkles in the vagina because that's what makes it stretchy and pliable and allow it to lubricate and things like that. So you can actually see the changes happening. And I always joke, uh, I've heard, you've heard this joke before, but if a penis shriveled up at age 52, we would have vaccines available for prevention, but women in menopause are losing their labia minora. Those inner wings are disappearing and resorbing completely, which is very frustrating uh, uh, for women who enjoy sexual activity and intimacy uh, because it can really change what tools you have sort of at your disposal. So why aren't our doctors telling us? I mean, you're a young activist doctor on Twitter. You're a urologist. You're a sex med specialist. Um, There are a few of you. There's Ashley Winter. There's a bunch of you out there screaming into the void. What happened? Why aren't all of us being told on our 50th birthday, hey, here's vaginal estrogen. You're going to be taking this for life. Yeah, so it's a really important... um, it's politics, it's medicine, politics, it's, it's a lot of things. And so before 2014, we didn't have the terminology genitourinary syndrome of menopause, what I call GSM, genitourinary syndrome of menopause. It didn't exist before 2014. It was called vaginal atrophy or atrophic vaginitis. And it was sort of within the realm of gynecology to treat. And so it was, it was to treat it. So we, we've had vaginal estrogen or vaginal hormone products uh, available since the seventies. And it was, it's indicated for pain with sex. So you have to go to your doctor and say, I have pain with sex, which most women will not go do, right? Because we know from data in 10 minutes, that's the last thing that you're going to bring up with your doctor because you have important things to talk about, like your mammogram and your pap smear and all the, you know, you only have 10 minutes. How are you going to do it all? So, 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 and then lube exists and, 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 and you hearing that it's normal to have pain with sex and, and all of the, you know, or it's normal to have a low libido. It's normal to not be interested in your partner. And so we don't think that this is something our doctor can help with. And so you have to tell your gynecologist, I have pain with sex. And then you get the prescription. And then you don't know that you have to take it forever and ever and ever. You just take it for a little while. It is not until 2014 that that light switch went off and we changed it to be about urination. And we said, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. Uh, These are urinary symptoms, frequency and urgency and leakage and, and bladder issues and urinary tract infections, which can kill. And it has taken some of us activists in terms of screaming into the void of saying, why aren't we doing this at a very big level? And part of it is we have so much work to do. This is one tiny piece of the unbelievable amounts. Most people are not picketing in in front of Congress for their vaginal estrogen and to (laughs) save their, it just isn't happening. And so it's taken a couple of us of screaming very loudly on Twitter. And it's been kind of we, 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 we do it through love, like we educate through love and really want to empower other doctors to say, hey, you can help so many people with this therapy that will not hurt a single patient. Here's how you do it. Here's how you write the prescription. Here's how you get it cost effectively. Let me help you and teach you because no one ever taught you when you were in school. And I get in front of thousands of primary care doctors, gynecologists, urologists. We have ER doctors listening now, which is amazing. Um, And I I do believe we are changing the conversation. It's slow. Um, But, uh, you know, as of a few years ago, We know less than 6% of women are on any therapy for local vaginal uh, hormones, less than 6%. And I would argue probably, uh, I can't say nothing's ever 100% because, you know, but, but, but so many women suffer with genitourinary syndrome of menopause and they don't even know what it is. So, um, 
after I was on, so I, I went on vaginal estrogen because of UTIs. So I had a long-term partner, that relationship broke up. I'm back out there in the world. I get another UTI thinking, why am I getting UTI? I'm taking the systemic estrogen. I talk to you as I often do when I'm wondering what's going on. And then what happens? Three months into this, I send you an email and I said, wait a minute. And I say, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> And, and so I said, it's like, is this the Holy Grail, you know, vaginal version of Viagra? And you said, yes, and nobody's telling you about it. I mean, that is what is driving me crazy. It's like, why doesn't every GP, like the GPs, you know, general practitioners are now talking to their male patients about erections and about sexual health and well being. Do you want the little blue pill? Why aren't they doing the same for us? Well, it's a big problem because GPs, first of all, the, the, the idea of what a, G, a general practitioner is, a, is able to do in a 10 minute visit or 20 minute visit, it, it's impossible, right? It's impossible what they have to do. And they're actually told by they are governing bodies not to do pelvic exams anymore. They kind of have moved away from doing pelvic exams, which I don't care if they do pap smears or not, but to not look at a person's genitals as part of a physical exam to me is a big problem because you will miss a lot of people over 50 once they're in menopause don't necessarily go to a gynecologist regularly. And so you will miss genitourinary syndrome of menopause if you don't ask for it, ask about it. You will miss things like lichen sclerosis, which can lead to vulvar cancers. You will miss that melanoma or the vulvar cancer, because women are not looking at their own genitals. You have to do gymnastics. You know, men look at their penises. If they have a freckle or a, a wrinkle or something like that, and they rush to the doctors and what is this new vein that I have? And I say, it's normal, nothing to do about it. And so <laughs> women do not do that, right? They don't, uh, occasionally you'll see a woman do that, but, but majority of patients don't look. And so if their primary care doctors are not looking, I have a big problem with that. So I, again, try to teach through love and really try to teach the primary care doctors that they can do this, they don't want to hurt women, right? They think they are so afraid of hurting women and with hormones that are shrouded in so much controversy and fear, they think all hormones are bad because they read the headlines too in the early 2000s and primary care doctors, God bless them. I don't know how they know all of the things that they know, but there is no way. I barely know everything about urology and that is a tiny little field, right? I know a lot about the sexual medicine pieces of urology, but don't ask me about, you know, the latest and greatest in kidney stones. <laughs> and so what we expect of our primary care doctors is a lot. And so I, I try to make it really easy and really fun. And, and really, you know, when you have the tools to help someone, you'll bring it up more because if they don't know what to do for that frequency, urgency, vaginal dryness, or pain, why would they bring it up? But if they say, oh, wait a minute, I, I know Dr. Rubin said something on Twitter. Hold on one second. Let me pull up. And, and doctors are starting to do that, which is so cool. Yeah, I found some of those tweets. So I would even argue that not even the gynecologist, like you go to the gynecologist and you get a pap smear, or in my case, I don't have a cervix anymore. So they just kind of look in there, but like, they're not even telling you to get this vaginal estrogen. And then I did a little research and I found a 2018 study that said, of the primary care providers, gynecologists, basically those on the front line of female medicine, vagina medicine, right? Anyone that's supposed to be thinking about what's going on down there, only 6.8% felt adequately prepared to do this. Now, were you given, I mean, obviously you went into this field, so you were probably given some courses in menopausal medicine. But again, the, the statistics show that only 20% of, of, of med school students are, are learning anything about menopause whatsoever. Why? What's going on? I mean, that's an hour long conversation about politics, about what the Women's Health Initiative in the early 2000s did for training of doctors. Overnight, we took this idea that hormones were great and wonderful. And overnight, uh, there was the NIH did a press, a press conference before a paper was even released. It was front page of the news before a paper was even released. Matt Lauer was talking about when Matt Lauer was a thing. He was talking about it, right? Uh, live on television saying hormones are dangerous. They kill women, they give breast cancer. The paper hadn't even come out. What NIH study, even with COVID, we don't see that happening. Like what NIH study does that happen to? So because that happened in the early 2000s, all overnight, everyone said, oh, okay, hormones are all dangerous. They're all bad. And the paper finally came out and it was 
not all bad. In fact, it was a lot of good, mostly good with like a little bit of nuance of maybe some gray and actually very little truly bad, especially with what we know today about the types of hormones that we give people, which we tend to like to stay away from like pills, like birth control pills, because that can increase the risk of blood clots. And so when you don't do it in a pill form, like a gel, like for example, what you're doing, we think the risk goes down uh, uh, dramatically when you, when you take that away. So the answer is nothing is all good or bad, but I don't know about you, but in America, we've learned in 2022, we don't do gray so well. We're not really that into nuance or, or, or gray or really trying to understand. We want to know, is it good? Is it bad? Is it, you know, a, a, and um, hormones are not all good or all bad for all people, except local vaginal hormones are good for all humans uh, uh, because they help partners, right? They help people with erections. They help people with vaginas. They help bladders. They help urethras. They're great for everybody. Okay. So sort of in conclusion here, what would you say to any woman watching this? Who's like, I don't know anything about this. I can't believe I haven't heard about this. What would you tell them to go tell their doctors? What, what information should they be armed with when they go next to talk to either the gynecologist, a urologist or a GP? Um, so there's lots of great resources out there and I'm hoping that we can start to create more. Uh, follow me on social media. That's a good place to start. Uh, well, tell uh, us, my, tell us what your, what, what yeah, is your my, my handle is at Dr. Rachel Rubin, uh, D-R-R-A-C-H-E-L-R-U-B-I-N. My pin Twitter thread is all about GSM and sort of takes doctors and patients through what it is, why it's important to treat, how to treat it, uh, why it's so wonderful to treat. Uh, it's not hard. It's not complex. It's not rocket science. I have patients with breast cancer on the these uh, products on these medications with the permission of their oncologist. Uh, there is, there's uh, patients with history of blood clots that are on these local vaginal hormones. Uh, uh, we have lots of clot doctors on Twitter telling us it's totally fine. And so there are really no, uh, no patients who can't use, if you're even transgender men often uh, will need a GSM therapy and treatments um, uh, for their areas that may uh, not be estrogenized enough. And so it, it is actually important for so many humans. If you're a man who has erectile dysfunction and has a partner with a vagina that you would like to penetrate, it doesn't matter how hard the erection is. If it has genitourinary syndrome of menopause and it's dry and it's irritated, it doesn't matter how much Viagra you take. It's never going to be comfortable for your partner. And so I know my male patients all want to fix their problems, but sometimes it's the partner that we have to work with, which is why I love that I can see everybody that comes to my office and really try to get everything to kind of work together because if you don't want to have sex, you do not have to have sex, right? If you don't want to have penetration, you don't have to have penetration. For me, this is about bladder health, preventing urinary tract infections, preventing that 90 year old woman who goes to the hospital with a urinary tract infection in the middle of COVID and there's no bed for her. And she has, you know, altered mental status uh, and they put a catheter in and it gets way worse. And then that can kill her, right? I don't want to see that 90 year old patient. I want to see the 50 year old patient where I prevent that from ever happening. So that it's just a new way to think about it. And I think uh, it's, things are changing. I'm hopeful, um, but we do have a very long way to go. Okay. And then one last question. Um, where do you practice and are you taking new patients? Because maybe people want to come see you directly. Absolutely. Um, uh, as I don't like the way medicine is and, and medicine is a very broken, very sad place right now. And insurance companies deciding that they think a 10 minute visit with your doctor is acceptable. I will not play that game. And I've, I've stepped out of uh, that game. And so I actually just opened my own practice. I started my, I hung a shingle and we're in the Washington DC area. I am seeing new patients and I'd be thrilled to work with everyone because quality of life is so important. Quality of life is everything. And your quality of life. What gives Deb her quality of life is not what gives her cousin or her sister or her neighbor. And so sitting down with a doctor to really go over each of these quality of life questions and, and what's going on with you and then customizing your treatment plan to what makes sense for you because you did fine on your systemic therapy for a while and then we had to tweak we had to tinker for goodness sake you're not even my patient but but just <laughs> from my education on on twitter you've been able to figure out what is working for you and working with a doctor who is knowledgeable because you want to see someone who knows about this stuff because not all doctors know everything we can't we cannot know everything you don't want to come to see me for what you should do for your 
your uh, breast cancer treatment or your prostate cancer treatment, but you want to see me for menopause, for pelvic pain, for any kind of sexual health issue where where you think you are not being heard because, because there are doctors who want to listen to you and who also want to take what's going on with you and say, okay, what is the science here? What is the physiology? What is actually happening and how can we get you feeling better? Um, and it can be challenging sometimes, but, but giving people time is just, it makes my job. Oh my gosh. It's the most fun thing in the world. Well, thank you so much for giving me your time. I know you've been so busy this week. I really appreciate it. It's Sunday night. The Oscars are on. I know everybody wants to go watch whatever, but thank you so much for taking the time. I'm going to press stop on the record. And we'll, thank you for you know, having me. Okay. Hold on one second. How would I press stop? Stop recording.